Okay, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 10. I, I, I got to say this before I go any further, and I realize this is on camera and TV and all that kind of stuff, but, I, you know, I thought putting on a new belt this morning would, would work, but I, I, I keep feeling like I'm about, my pants are about to fall off, and I'm on the last notch, and, and, and I'm, well, I'm glad I'm losing weight, and I'm doing that on purpose, but, but I, if you just see me walking around like this, you'll know that, that I'm, I'm just, I've had this vision of me being here and being on a camera, and it go on TV, and my pants just fall around my ankles, you know, and, and uh, I wouldn't want to scare anybody that way. But anyway, it just, I'm, I'm wrestling with that this morning. Now, if I had a rope, I'd probably just tie it around me so I could get through this without being aggravated by it. The book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 38 How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the man, Jesus of Nazareth, not the God, not Christ of glory, but how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all. Everybody say all. Healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now, I'll get to that verse in just a moment, but I want to kind of talk to you a moment if I can. It, it has just become more and more increasingly clear to me that most people's Bible starts in Genesis chapter 3. I have become, I, I don't know how, how to say this, but increasingly aware of what the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, is lacking in our comprehension of understanding when we just take Genesis 3 from the fall and get people to heaven. There's more to the story. Okay? There's more to the story. I feel like that I've been saved all my life I feel like I have not been afraid of death. As a young man, I knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that I was trusting Jesus for my salvation, that if I died, if anything happened, I knew exactly that I would be in the presence of the Lord. Never had that question. I know everybody hasn't had that, but I'm just saying it's always been there with me. But the problem is, I, and I might as well just, just tell you the whole story, i, I was recommended a book and bought a book and got this book and uh, it was on foundational things and when I saw the passage that it was using from Hebrews I thought man I need more understanding of this and I'll get into this and 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 I, I, this will be something I can teach this will be something I can preach and I I get this book and I sit down and and in one setting I go through the entire book and I'm, I'm, I'm looking and underlining and writing all of the things that I think are important and I need to say. And then, and then when it's talking about foundational things, it hits me about halfway through the book. This is only Genesis 3 to the epistles, not the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay, and I realize we're on camera. I realize I'm in trouble, but I've been in trouble and I'm going to stay in trouble with some people's theology. Jesus was in trouble with his theology. You got Genesis 1 and 2 before you get to the fall. 
God put man here on the earth, made man, created man, put him in a good environment, put him here for a reason and a purpose, and he had a purpose while he was here. The book of Revelation, if you'll just go to the book and look at it, it'll tell you the title of the book is The Revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of the end of times. It's not, it's not there. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. If you're looking for what's in the world instead of who Jesus is, you're not going to understand the book of Revelations. So there is a beginning to the book and there is a finish of the book. And in the middle you run into this place in Romans where it says that we've been predestined to be conformed to the image of who? Jesus Christ. Well, if you think Jesus Christ looks like the end of times, and you think it's revelation of Jesus Christ is the revelation of end of times, how are you ever going to look like him? Just listen to me a minute. Well, Pastor... We've never been taught that. Okay, I haven't either. Pastor, some of the stuff you're preaching and teaching is overwhelming me for you to really believe that God placed us on the planet to have dominion over every creeping thing and be in charge of developing a planet that he wants us to rule and to reign in is just so overwhelming, I don't know that I can do it. Join the overwhelming club with me. But he's going to do it through us, not us do it. That's the problem religion got us thinking. We got to get it all together and do it ourselves because it's our works, it's what we do, and we do everything in there, not realizing he's going to do it through us. Do you know, and I'm saying this in a way that you don't have to heal anybody, but you've got to cooperate with letting him heal somebody through you. You've got to understand that it's his will to bless you and be with you and walk with you and he loves you and he's on your side. You've got to believe all of that. I mean, you know, the Lord didn't start his story in Genesis 3. If you read Genesis 1 and 2, and I've told you this just a few weeks ago, and I've been messed up ever since that with, with, with things happening because I keep reading these books, picking up things, and I'm thinking, we're missing it, we're missing it, we're missing it. When God did things in Genesis, he said it's, it's good. Seven times in Genesis 1 and 2, he speaks the word good, it is good. After he created humankind, the human being, he looked at everything that he said that he created and he said it is very good. All of creation was good. When he added human beings to the scene, he said it's very good. Do you know why everything he did was good? Cause God is good. That's a revelation to some people. Because you talk to some people and God's an ogre, God's this great big thing, he's trying his best to just catch you, do something, he's trying to send you to hell, he's trying to destroy you, he's trying to test you, he's trying to tempt you, he's trying to judge you. You get around some people and I wouldn't like God either if I thought about him the way they think about him. Say this with me, say God is good. Matter of fact, here's what I want you to do. Stand up, turn around, and look at somebody and say, God is good. Say it to two or three people around you. Tell them, God is good. Say it, God is good. I 
I just saved somebody from snoring during the message. <laughs> now, everything he does and everything he creates is good. I, I, I have titled this message this morning, Three Incarnations. Three incarnations, because I want you to get the impact. The first incarnation, and for any of you who don't know it, we, we've all been taught about God incarnating himself in Christ and, and, and the deity becoming to the earth and be a, becoming in a form. I want you to understand that that's what we've been taught about incarnation. But I want you to understand that the first incarnation happened before Genesis 3 in 1 and 2 when God came down and created the heavens and the earth. He came down and it was an incarnation of God's physical, visible attributes, his eternal power, and his divine nation when he spoke this earth into existence and God, in who he is, invaded planet earth. God manifested himself, if I could say it like this, in the time, space, universe. He created time and then he placed himself in time, space, universe. Now, Jesus, who we know was God manifested in the flesh, when Jesus walked the earth, I read you Acts 10, 38, because it said he went about doing, you know why he did good, don't you? God is good. He is good. He went about doing good and healing. Oh, you know, he only heals those who live right. Oh, he only lives, heals those who's got it all together. Oh, he only heals the people who always know exactly what to say and how to do. No, he heals all who are oppressed of the devil. Get it in your mind. God wants you whole. We got to start believing that. Well, now that's not for so and so. I've watched, I've done. Quit judging them. I can't find where Jesus went up to any sinner and told them how sinful they were. I can't find any place where Jesus told them if they would believe on him, they would go to heaven. He looked at the 12 and said, follow me and I will make you what? Fishers of men. Now listen. Jesus didn't preach, you can go to heaven. Jesus brought heaven to them because he went about doing good and healing all that was oppressed of the devil. He restored them to what is good. This is just too far back for me. Now, If you can just take this little journey with me for a moment, if you can just, if I can just mess with your thinking a little bit. When Jesus came as the Son of God, born in a stable, born in the earth, Jesus came and introduced us to the family of God. Up until the time of Jesus' arrival, 
God was just God. And Jesus comes in, and now you got a father, you got a son. You understand what I'm saying? He begins to introduce something of a family. Now, I want you to kind of catch that so you can hear what, what I am saying. This family that God introduces through the person of Jesus Christ is filled with a life of restoration, healing, purpose, and freedom. He wants us to live in what is good that he created. First incarnation was everything that he created on planet earth. Second incarnation, Jesus. I'll get to the third one in a moment, but just bear with me for a moment. If you go back to Genesis and you begin to read the tree that God wanted Adam and Eve to eat out of was the tree of life. There were two trees in the garden, tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And you know what God did not want them eating out of? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He wanted them eating out of the tree of life. Go back and read it. Yeah, that's what he wanted to even out of. If we go back to Genesis 1 and don't go to Genesis 3 to start our walk with God, we'll understand he wants us eating out of the tree of life, not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because the knowledge of good and evil is what causes us to judge one another. Do you know who the first person Adam and Eve judged? was themselves. They did what they shouldn't do, and God came and said, why did you cover yourself? Because we were naked. He said, who told you you were naked? Now, God gave the original pair, Adam and Eve, in Genesis 1 and 2, he gave the original pair the responsibility of ruling creation on his behalf. Who named all the animals? Man. Adam did. Who did he give authority over all the earth to? Adam. Man. God's purposes on the earth were administered and manifested through Adam and Eve. And the garden was the intended place for God's presence. That's where his presence was. That's where they would fellowship with him. Now, in this garden, it's, it's the place which contains creation's couple in the beginning. And from that creation of the Garden of Eden, they were supposed to, being placed in that garden, eating from the tree of life, they were supposed to be bring extended order and beauty through their offspring to the entire planet. That was God's plan through Adam and Eve, was to take this relationship that he had with them and them have dominion over everything that was created on planet Earth. But there was a separation that took place from God and man. And man caused the separation. Man decided through listening to the serpent that they could be different. Now watch. God had chosen to share his sovereignty and his dominion with humanity as a part of his 
imparted image. In other words, God said, let us make man in his image, in his likeness. Let them have dominion. And that, that's, that's that what happened. So man made that separation and a man would have to take the responsibility to restore what had been lost. Please hear me say this. All that was lost was about dominion and authority over the earth. Gosh, I wish I knew how to say this in a way that, 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 it, it, that, that you would get it. Man rebelled and went his own way that's why another man, the second Adam, Jesus, had to come back to restore everything Adam lost. But if you start with man at the fall and you try to tell everybody that they're in sin and you only tell them that they need a Savior from their sin and they just accept Jesus so they can go to heaven, they are missing everything that he was restoring back for man to have dominion on planet earth. Is this simple enough? I mean, am I getting it across? Man failed, so a man had to come. Now, God was patient. He didn't just immediately come down and move them or do something. No, God was patient. He walked with them. And, and it, it, it's, it's, you know, a couple thousand years before Jesus comes on the scene. But God chose to invade earth with a second man who came from heaven. And the Bible says that Jesus was the last Adam. Last Adam. I'm talking today about three incarnations. One was God invaded the earth, created everything that he created in creation, created man. His divine power came into being on planet earth. Man fell. The second incarnation was God interceded and came in the person of Jesus Christ and began to walk the earth. Jesus is the second incarnation. The Father manifested himself in human flesh. The Father gave, the, gave to Jesus, the Son, authority to put down the rebellion, to begin the work of reconciliation. Do you all understand he's clear in the Gospels, and I mean in the uh, uh, New Testament, when you get into the uh, books of the church, that he has given to us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Notice he doesn't give us the ministry of escapism. What do you mean? Well, you better get right and you better get ready because if you don't get out here, the devil's going to take over and he's going to have everything on the planet. Ooh. That's knowledge of good and evil. That's not knowledge of life. That was never God's purpose. Religion made it a purpose. We have the ministry of what? Reconciliation. We also, God gave the Son authority to overturn the rebellion, conquer death, hell, and the grave. De de Man, I could chase this rabbit all day, but I won't. What did he conquer? Death, hell, and the grave. Why are you worried about any three of them if he's already conquered them? I ain't worried about death. I ain't worried about hell. I ain't worried about the grave. Why? You all do know that the graves are going to burst open. The dead in Christ will rise. Help me, Lord. The 
third thing God gave the Son authority was to release the power, release the power of His resurrection into the earth to begin reversing the corruption of death. He said to Adam, the day you eat of this tree, he did not say you'll go to hell. He said, the day you eat of this tree, you shall surely die. Jesus came back and conquered death, and death is being reversed. Mr. Farley, I don't understand. Well, stick around, you will, someday. In the sweet by and by. Look at Luke chapter 22 with me. I'm joking when I say that, by the way, for those of you that think I'm looking for the sweet by and by. I'm happy with the sweet now and now. You know, if you just start looking around at your church family and your family and your kids and your grandkids and turn TV off, life would get a whole lot better for you. I don't know things are bad till I turn on news. It's amazing. Well, you got to know what's going on. Pastor Farley, you got to know what's going on. You got to know what's going on. I tell you what's going on is life. Full life with Christ and people you love. Luke 22, look at verse 28. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one upon me that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, we sit here, and because of what we've been taught, we go through all this theological thing and wonder. He was talking to his disciples here. You've been, I've been given a kingdom. You can eat with me and drink with me. You know what he did in the Last Supper. You know his time with the disciples and all of the fellowship and all the thing that he did with them. But Jesus had come to the earth, and he had finished the work that the Father had given him to do. He was able to declare when that work was finished that my Father has granted me a kingdom. The kingdom was given to Christ by the Father and he had been faithful over all the things that the Father had given him. I'm not struggling with whether you go to heaven or not. But I am struggling with how do I get people to get excited about and joyful about and motivated about operating, functioning, and living in the kingdom of God. all kinds of places I could go here and teach. You're born into the, you can say, well, you're born into the kingdom when you teach. Yeah, but if you remain a baby and you stay a baby, you're going to be a baby just like the one who's a tutor. He has those over him even though he's heir to everything that's there. He can't operate that because he has to have somebody over him because until he reaches a place of maturity, he can't function in the kingdom. One of the things that wanted me to read the book that I wanted to read was a, 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 an illustration that I had saw in there of a guy who went to an elementary school and we got to the elementary school, he goes to this classroom and in this classroom of elementary students was a guy sitting there who was 60 years old. And he went into the classroom, began to listen and said, why is he here? He said, well, he's, he's, he's never passed the second grade. He's 60 years old. He's been in here for over 50 years. Why? He can't get promoted. How 
How many kids in church that are 60 years of age or older are still living and believing and walking in the second grade? Help me, Lord. Now, let me just make a couple of statements. I'm not trying to goof anybody up, and I know there's people who will fuss with me on this, but I, I, I'm, I'm trying to say it the best I can. If I don't say it the way you think I should say it, I'm sure I'm the one that's wrong and you're right. So just leave it at that. But if you carefully examine the New Testament and you begin to read the New Testament about the kingdom of God, everybody say kingdom of God. We discover in the New Testament that the kingdom of God can be inherited, it can be entered into, and it can be taken away. Now, I want to make sure that everybody understands this. Entering the kingdom or exiting the kingdom does not have anything to do with redemption. It's a whole different work than redemption. Entering the kingdom or exiting the kingdom has everything to do with the manifestation of the power and power and presence of God and the love of God in human beings operating here on the earth. Where is the kingdom of God right now? It's within us. It's right here. It's all around us. It's not someplace way up in the sky. But you can, let me say it like this. I can walk in the kingdom or I can walk in Stuart. Do you get the message? Huh? I, I could go to every one of you. Lynn can walk in the kingdom or Lynn can walk in Lynn. Every day she gets up, she wants to walk in the kingdom. Most of us do. But we get in our own way. But the kingdom can be inherited. It can be entered into and it can be taken Way because it, and it's it's important because Jesus says to his disciples next, I have received a kingdom. My Father has given me a kingdom, and Jesus is looking at his disciples and he's making this statement. I grant you part in my kingdom. You can eat with me. You can dine with me in my kingdom. I just read it to you. Do you need, let me go back and, and, and read it again here, Luke 22, verse 28. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow on you a kingdom, just as my Father bestowed upon on me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. I want you to understand he gave them the authority to do that. Now let me read you a couple of scriptures. Back in Matthew Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Just listen to these scriptures. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. Now let me ask you a question. What do you have to do to be saved? Call on the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. The thief on the cross looked at Jesus and said, Remember me. And he said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. He was not taught, he didn't say you're going to function in my kingdom here on this earth. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom, but he who does the will of my Father. Matthew chapter 21, Matthew 21, verse 43 says, Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing its fruit. Now listen to me. Here's what happened here. God gave the kingdom to Israel, but they failed or refused to produce the fruit of that kingdom. Therefore, Jesus declared the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people or a nation producing the fruits of the kingdom. Let 
What do we have to do for us to get in an agreement relationship with God where we've been reconciled with God and we begin to function in the kingdom of God, not just a bunch of sinners who are going to heaven. How do we function in this kingdom? Listen to me. After his resurrection, after Jesus' resurrection, he told his disciples, here's what he said. You all have read it. This is the Great Commission. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, the reason he had authority is because the Father had given him a kingdom. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus, Jesus then turns around and gave his kingdom to the apostles and through them he began to establish a new nation, a new race, one new man, and a new Jerusalem. It's what he began to establish through the disciples when he gave them their kingdom. What he said, a new governing authority that was incarnated and released on the earth. First carnation, incarnation was creation. God came and entered the earth, created all things. Second incarnation was Jesus Christ. God entered the human race. After the resurrection, Jesus now has a kingdom that he's imparting to his disciples. There was great opposition to this new government. government. There was great opposition to this new covenant. There was great opposition to, this new, to the new forms of righteousness I mean, it was fierce what was going here when Jesus comes and introduces this new thing. I mean, do you realize they were going around killing everybody who believed or followed Jesus? It's fierce. But do you realize that the rulers of darkness were clueless, were clueless what would happen when they killed Jesus. They had no idea that God would resurrect him from the dead. They thought they were solving a problem. They did not understand that the crucifixion would result in resurrection. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ released the power of the Holy Spirit invading the earth and activating kingdom invasion. Let me ask you a question. When you accepted Jesus into your heart and you invited him into your heart, in his kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy came to be a part of your life. Do you realize the power that is invested with the third person of the Godhead taking up residence, living on the inside of us? Why does he want to live in us? Well, Pastor, we know that so that when we, when, when, when we die, we can go to heaven. It's not even in the plan. What did Jesus do when he died? Y'all know what he did? He went to hell and took the keys, took the keys to death and to hell. Let me ask you a question. What do you use keys for?
Do you realize that he unlocked death? Huh? Death has been unlocked. You know, when he was here, he went around doing good. Did he raise some from the dead to show you it could be done? Yes, he did. Now watch. By his crucifixion and resurrection, Christ broke the dominion of the ruling empires and brought to nothing the power of death. The work of the cross, the work of the cross was to bring heaven and earth back together. What do you mean? He made peace through the blood of his cross. Through the resurrection, the Spirit of Christ has been made available to the assembly of all God's people. We now have the Spirit of Christ. The same Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells and lives in you and I. What do you mean? Well, the kingdom reality is being birthed in my person and your person. What are you saying? This is really what I was trying to talk last week about. This is Christ is being formed in you. Do you remember Paul talking about that? I labor in, till Christ is formed in you. Do you realize Christ is being formed in us? <coughs> Heaven is invading us through a new birth, one new man, a new creation, a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. Do you know if you go and study your New Testament, you will find out that it teaches about a new birth. It teaches about you are a new man in Christ Jesus. You will discover you are a new creation, a species of being that's never existed before. You will find out that there is a new heaven that was birthed. There, you will find out there's a new earth that was birthed, and you will find that there's a new Jerusalem. Everybody, again, wants to go to Revelation and talk about uh, the new Jerusalem that's there, but if you go and you just read your, but just go read Revelation 19, 20, 21, and 22, and you'll read in there, whereas I, John, saw the new city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. It does not say anywhere there that I, John, saw the saints going up there to the new city Jerusalem. Yeah, Lord, I know they don't amen me on that very often. Can I tell you what God's wanting to do? My time's about gone. I, just, I really want to just talk a minute from my heart. God wants to bring his love and heal a hurting world. And the only way he's going to do us, do it, is through us. We are called and predestined. We are called and predestined to be the third incarnation of God and his deity manifested on planet earth and all of the first de the first incarnation of all his creation is waiting for the manifestation of the third incarnation or the sons of God who begin to bring order from chaos on a planet that God designed for us to have dominion and authority and rule on. Now look at me, listen to me. I'm not talking about it coming through politics or through government or through anything else. I'm talking about it coming through the kingdom of God and the church becoming who, the church becoming who Jesus decided he would do. He said, I will build my church and hell can't stop it. Why? He's already defeated death, hell, and the grave. He's already defeated the devil. Now listen to me. It's clear from the New Testament, clear from the New Testament, that we've been given the authority and the power to carry 
the message of the good news to the whole world. But look at me. The message is not heaven there. The message is heaven here. I, I, I realize how upsetting that is to some people. Let me read you You all, I'm going to read you from the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. I'm going to read it from the Passion Bible, and I want you to follow along with me for just a moment. But God the Father is working to conform us to the image of His Son. I have preached that for years in order that we might manifest His power in the same manner Jesus did. Do you all understand we're supposed to be, Jesus is our elder brother, and we're supposed to go about doing good, healing all that are oppressed of the devil just like Jesus did? Do you understand that's part of our mission? Pastor, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get saved and get involved to do that. I just got saved so I could go to heaven. Come on. Let me ask you a question. How selfish is that? How selfish is it for you to make what Jesus did in giving his life for the sins of the world all about him coming and coming into your heart and dying just for you so that you could go to heaven? Huh? Wonder how mad some people's going to be when they get there and they find out it's here. Surprise, surprise. Huh? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5 says, I'm reading from the Passion. For God will not place the coming world of which we speak under the government of angels, but the scriptures affirm what is man that you would even think about him or care about Adam's race. You made him lower than the angels for a little while. You placed your glory and honor upon his head as a crown, and listen to this, and you have given him dominion over the works of your hands, for you have placed everything under his authority. This means that God has left nothing outside the control of his son, even if presently we have not yet to see this accomplished. But if we start, don't start preaching it and start believing it, it's never going to be accomplished. What if we are raising up a generation that reaches the measure of the stature of the fullness of of Christ. Mr. Farley, why, why are these little kids so important to you? We don't know who we are influencing. We don't understand who we are impacting. When Christ encounters us, when we accept Christ as our personal Savior and He comes into our lives, is it just a church encounter? Is it just an intellectual encounter? Is it just an emotional encounter? When we encounter the risen Christ, we become empowered with the invisible force of God and a third incarnation is birthed in us. Whew. 
creation, Jesus, us. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now look at me and listen to me. I know every one of you, just like me, looks at that and thinks about that and say, Pastor, that's really good preaching, and I believe you believe what you're saying, but that just ain't possible for him to take middle old me, little me, who I am with what I have, and manifest himself in me the way he needs to manifest. That just ain't going to happen. It might if you'll get out of the way. When people look at me and say, Pastor, I've come to the end of my rope, they don't know what I mean when I look at them and say, well, that's good. Because you need to quit hanging on to the rope of your works and your belief and your way and let God be God in you. I hope you all understand. I need to do it too. I wrestle with it just like you do. See, I believe God has come to us with a kingdom offer. Kingdom offer. I want to come. I want to live inside of you. And I want to do things with you, in you, and through you that will heal a hurting world. How are you going to do it? One person at a time. One kind deed at a time. One healing act at a time. Lord, You mean you have literally taken up your residence on the inside of me? Yeah. Let me give you Paul's testimony, Philippians 3. Look what Paul said. Not that I have already attained or am already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that, that, for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me. I want to lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus. Paul saying, I have one thing in mind. He saved me because I mattered to him enough that he thought he could use me for a purpose. Don't you want to lay hold of that that Christ laid hold of you for? Do you realize that the grief and the suffering that you suffered with Christ and what you've gone through is help you so that you can minister what Jesus ministered to you in your grief and in your pain and in your suffering, that now you have the ability to take that and minister that same grace and that same mercy and that same love to somebody else. Don't you realize that he takes everything that you are, fills you and comes in to live with you so that you can have a life with a purpose. Listen to me, guys. For me, I'm talking about for me, to just be saved and go to heaven, Ain't enough. What do you mean? <laughs> it's just not enough. I want to walk with him every day. I want to talk with him every day. I want to be used by him every day. I want to love uh, people with his love every day. I want to encourage people every day. I want to do things every day. Pastor, why, 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 why do you... <clears throat> you know, we're, we're, we're trying to put together new playground equipment for all the kids. Why? I want kids out there having encounters with godly people who's going to teach them about the love of Jesus. We try to do everything that we do, and God's blessed us with so much. Why did he do it? So that we can impart Here's, here's what it is I'm trying to impart. You 
matter to him. You matter to him. You, your future, everything you are matters to him. You know how much you matter to him? He knows every pain, every shortcoming, every, everything you think and do. And you know what? It matters to him. Who do you come in contact with every day that's going through something? Wonder how you could help them if you believed they really mattered to him. And that he sent you to help him show them they matter. Hmm? Well, Pastor, you just, just they don't deserve it. What do you deserve? Self righteous person trying to be nice. I've served him most of my life. I've walked with him most of my life. I love working for him, but I'm going to tell you something. I don't matter to him because of all that I do for him. He chose me when I didn't matter to anybody. So what do you got to give to God? I ain't got nothing to give him. Well, good, he can use you because we keep trying to think our expertise and ability gets in the way of him doing what he wants to do through us. 